Hey everyone, we are back with a new video and had a great uh, week off last week. It was the first week I had an opportunity to rest, to relax since the, uh, the heart attack that I had back on November 4th of last year. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to sleep in most days and uh, also take some extra naps throughout the day. So uh, really enjoyed it. It's a nice break and um, also gave me a little bit more time to think and to meditate and to uh, pray and just meditate, contemplate uh, things. And so I have a bunch more that I want to share with you. And uh, in regard to this exposition of Romans chapter 10, and I want to take a few more steps uh, toward the closure of this uh, teaching. And um, so far in our study, we've gotten uh, up to verse 9 in Romans chapter 10. So I want to jump right in there and, um, and see what, uh, what comes out of this uh, as we inch closer to that conclusion. So uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Uh, thus far, we've uh, discovered that this Romans chapter 10 is really an exposition of two very different kinds of righteousness. The irony of this chapter is that there is no mention of the word hell in it. Um, there is no inclination or uh, implication throughout the chapter that um, there's something in here that we need to do in order to, quote, get saved. I know traditionally in Christian circles, this chapter is looked at as the chapter where the, quote, sinner's prayer is discussed, but... Uh, there is no mention of any such sinner's prayer in Romans chapter 10, much less throughout the rest of the Bible. It's just stuff that men made up. They, they did not really meditate on the scriptures. They did not really uh, seek the Lord, I think, with a pure heart, pure motive. So they twisted scripture out of context, conduct, uh, concocted some sort of magical incantation, uh, which if any quote, sinner, you know, utters it out of their lips or, or prays it with their mouth that automatically guarantees them the pearly gates. And uh, hopefully if you go back through some of these videos, um, you'll realize that there is a lot more depth to this chapter than what uh, tradition has ever led anyone to believe. Uh, remember, <clears throat> as I was talking in, in last video, that um, when we talk about the only thing that Jesus taught that could make the Word of God of no effect, most uh, Christians automatically gravi gravitate to the idea of unbelief. You know, unbelieving will quench the Word of God. But actually what Jesus taught was that it was the traditions of men that make the Word of God of no effect. And specifically traditions revolving around the Scriptures, uh, traditions revolving around our understanding, uh, traditions that we've received from denominations, um, some of our favorite preachers that we've idolized and burned incense to. These are the things that really rob us of the richness of what, or I should say who, the scriptures really testify of, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, the manifestation of the Father's love, the manifestation of the Father's glory, the very manifestation of the Father's heart. Um, he is the one around whom all scripture revolves. He is the one around or concerning whom the scriptures testify. And um, the only view of the Father that is going to stand in the end is the Lamb's view. And um, so anyway, let's jump in here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And... Um, talk a little bit more about this righteousness which is of faith. Because remember, Romans chapter 10 is really an exposition of two different kinds of righteousness. Number one, the righteousness which Moses describes, and that is found in verses 5 through 7. And the righteousness which is of faith. The righteousness which is of faith specifically is the love of the Father. And uh, I just probably should remind us once again, Romans chapter 1 says, Apostle Paul writes, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he says, For therein, within the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. We know that the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel is the very love of the Father. And it is that very love that literally saves and delivers us from going about and attempting to establish our own right standing with God who already loves us and who has already unconditionally shown his acceptance of us in the death of Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 10 verse 9, let's talk a little bit more about this righteousness of faith. It says uh, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We talked about this a little bit last video. I want to pick up here again. Remember, the only other option to confessing Jesus, in context of Romans chapter 10, the only other option to confessing the Lord Jesus is to confess the righteousness which Moses describes. And when we confess the righteousness which Moses describes instead of the Lord Jesus, our speech and our hearts are going to carry a spirit and an attitude that suggests that we and others must either ascend some magical stairway to heaven, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or the other option, who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up, work up, or drum up Christ again from the dead. Either way, the righteousness which Moses describes is a righteousness that is based on doing something, based on doing things. Whether ascending into heaven to bring him down, or working him up, drumming him up, or bringing him up from the dead. Um, either way, the 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 weight of bringing him down or working him up falls on us. And the fine print that no one ever really mentions in their best-selling Christian books is that once you attain that level of spirituality, you must then maintain it. No rest for the weary. That's why in the book of the Revelation it says they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast or his image. So um, it's not just enough to attain regarding the righteousness which Moses describes. Now you must maintain once you have attained. And so now that you have you know, ascended that magical stairway to heaven, now you've got to keep yourself up there. Once you've figured out a way to work up, drum up, or, or bring up Christ from the dead as if he were dead, you know, you, you, you basically work up an encounter through uh, a, a feverish uh, frenzy. Well, now you've got to keep that feverish pitch up in order to keep him up from the dead. And again, the weight, the burden, is going to fall on us. And we're not going to be able to hold up under that. Even if you could bring him down, bring him down from above, even if you could bring him up again from the dead, in order to maintain that intensity and that frenzy and that constant flawless performance and obedience... There's no way any human being could do it. And see, that's the very thing. These are the things, these are the very things that the revelation of the Father's love saves us from. These are the very things that the gospel of Jesus Christ delivers us from. I'm not going up to heaven or trying to go up to heaven to find him to bring him down. I'm not descending somewhere into the deep to work him up, drum him up, or bring him up from the dead. He's not dead, he's alive. What saves me from all that nonsense is the realization 
that is discovered at the cross of Jesus Christ, that in his death, our death in him was revealed. After the fire fell, after uh, the smoke cleared, after the dust settled, after the veil was rent from the top to the bottom of that most holy place, and the lights came back on, every single one of us would have seen their own dead corpse hanging on that cross if we were standing there. If we would have uh, stood there and gazed a little longer, we would eventually begin to behold one another. We would have seen everyone crucified and dead in him. Which is astounding because what Jesus' death revealed in his weakness and humiliation, what he revealed was the union that we have with the Father in and through him. Not anything that we do, not anything that we can perfectly perform, obey, or apply, not based on anything that we can work up and keep up, but we have eternal fellowship, eternal union with the Father in and through the physical body of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul used to get so caught up in the realization of this mystery that at times the stigmata, the marks of the Lord Jesus, would actually physically appear and manifest in his body, in his hands, feet, and side. Paul would actually show forth the marks of the Lord Jesus. That's what he meant when he said in Galatians chapter 6, he said, from, from henceforth let no man trouble me with his nonsense about thinking that they have to keep the law again. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. My my law-keeping, my obeying all the performance requirements and obedience standards of the dead letter of Scripture, th that's not what's causing the actual physical wounds of the Lord Jesus to appear in my mortal body. And then he goes on and he says, I don't boast in anything other than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me because I have a revelation that was given to me by the Spirit, and I have awakened unto this staggering reality that on the cross, Jesus revealed that his death was not just his death, it was mine. He didn't just die for me, he became me. Hebrews says we have such a high priest who became us. He didn't just die for us, he became us and died as us. That's why in Romans chapter 6 it says, You are alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through prayer, not through fasting, not through Bible study, not through self-flagellation and all these crazy things that we think we need to do, and then of course maintain once we've attained you are alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what this is saying in Romans chapter 10. I guess if you wanted to go back, we could go back to verse 8. It says, what does it say? What does this righteousness which is of faith say? Or in other words, you could say it this way. What does the love of the Father revealed in the cross of Christ actually communicate? And it says the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. And Apostle Paul said, that is the word of faith which we preach. We, what he's saying in essence is we are conscious of this indwelling presence of Christ. We are conscious of this indwelling union that we share with the Godhead in and through the physical body of Jesus Christ. And that union is 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 has given us access to this fellowship, and we're discerning a word from that presence um, that's flowing by grace, and meaning not our effort, not by our might, not by our power, but by His Spirit. And we're just dumb enough and bold enough to actually say that word. And... He goes on and he says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Well, again, the only other option to confessing the Lord Jesus is confessing the righteousness which Moses describes. So if you put those two scriptures together, what you have is there is a word that is emanating from the indwelling spirit that lives within us. And that word is a pouring forth of a revelation that revolves around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, what his death actually reveals regarding our past, our old man, our former nature, our former identity. It's a word that um, is anchored in his finished work and what his death accomplished in regard to our sin, in regard to everything that literally Adam's sin brought into the world. And there's this living utterance that keeps pouring forth from within, from the Spirit, that is expounding on that person of the Lord Jesus. What he has done, not what you have to do, not what I have to do, whether it be ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above, descend into the deep, work him up from the dead. It, the gospel is not about any of that. The gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the gospel. And the spirit that is within us is quickening these things to us within us that pertain to the person of the Lord Jesus. Again, his finished work, what his death accomplished in regard to sin, and all that sin brought with it into the world through Adam, and also in regard to what Jesus' death actually reveals. And what his death reveals is union with the Father. What his death re reveals is that we are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. What his death reveals is that the Father is not... A, see, this is the beautiful thing. God is keeping both sides of this covenant. The Father is keeping God's side of it. Jesus is keeping man's side of it. The Father is keeping God's side. The Son is keeping man's side all in the body of Jesus Christ. So you get these people today, and it's, this has been going on for decades, folks. I don't understand why people love to be ignorant. I don't understand why it is so painful for some people to exert some gray matter to actually think about something, perhaps even consider something outside of their normal comfort zone of the drone of their daily thinking. Like, maybe there's something more to this than what I've been seeing. Maybe there's something more to this than what I've been considering. But I don't want to open myself up to it because it could let in a devil. I think we're interacting with devils just fine. Coffee break. What's sad is that's our attitude, whether we know it or not. That's our attitude toward the truth. And I'm going to tell you something. The truth is what makes us free. Not your truth, not my truth. Your truth and my truth are both irrelevant. Jesus prayed in John 17. He said, Father, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 91, the psalmist writes, and he says, Your truth shall be my shield and buckler, not my truth or anyone else's. There is a truth that makes us free. And man, oh man, would it be great someday if we actually had some reverence for it. Instead of, you know, exalting and glor glorifying our own ideas and thoughts and opinions, and emotions especially. Thank God that the Father 
is much greater than our emotions and even our own opinions. But we want a true picture of the Father. We need not look any further than the person of the Lord Jesus because he that sees the Lord Jesus sees and knows the Father. And he's not a Pharaoh in heaven who's ever crouching and waiting to reward our performance and obedience and punish every slightest disobedient step we take. He's not that kind of father. He's not a performance-driven, reward-based father. He is fellowship-driven because he's love-driven. He is love. And... Uh, His love is a love that even treats those who don't deserve it as if they do. But now I'm getting on to another tangent. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, why is that significant? Again, when I am confessing the Lord Jesus, I am not confessing the righteousness which Moses describes. I will not be giving people something they need to do to get saved, or something that they need to do to work up some kind of supernatural encounter or manifestation. This gospel is not about what you have to do, nor what I have to do. It's a revelation of the person of the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is an understanding and unveiling a revelation of what He has done. I don't know how more simple I can, how much more simple I can be. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. We're declaring a person. We're declaring who He is. We're declaring what He has done. And the fact in His death it is revealed, whether self-righteous people like it or not, no one has been excluded from his sacrifice. And so then, of course, what, what's American Christianity without throwing labels and stereotypes at people? You're one of those inclusionists. You preach this inclusionist gospel that everyone is legally saved. They are. Don't you know how to read? Did you ever read your New Testament without the help of, oh, I don't know, a commentary from ten other preachers? Did you actually open up your heart and read the New Testament from the book of Romans through the book of Jude? That when one man died is all. That at that point when that one man died, all men died. And there's countless reference to, references to this. <laughs> No one has been excluded. Everyone has been included. When Jesus talked about perfection in the Gospels, Matthew chapter, around chapter 5, be perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He makes his you know, sun to rise on the evil and he sends his rain on the unjust and so on and so forth. You look up that word perfect in the Greek and the definition of that word perfect does not mean that you don't make mistakes. Our, our view of perfection has been perverted. Perfection is not about making mistakes. Perfection is not about flawless performance. Perfection is really about completion. It's about fullness. And particular, particularly what Jesus was speaking about regarding perfection was the ability to love with the Father's love. And that word perfection comes from a Greek word, teleos, which means a circle, which if you study that out and pay attention to it, it means that the Father has excluded no one outside of the circle of his love. Think of the earth just rotating and revolving in outer space, the circle of the earth. No one's been excluded outside of the circle of his love. That means everybody in the world was included in Jesus' sacrifice. And anyone who argues differently, they just don't have a complete understanding of what happened at the cross and what Jesus' death revealed. 
and guaranteed they will give you something to do, either to get saved or something that you need to do and keep doing to keep working up some sort of supernatural encounter or manifestation or bringing it down from above uh, by, by applying all these steps and formulas and patterns and outlines and equations and sequences. Because you see, self-righteousness, the righteousness which Moses describes, which is the righteousness of the servant, not the righteousness of the son, is always based on doing something. And with that righteousness, there will always be attached one or both of those two sibling spirits of mind or attitudes of heart. Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring him down from above? Who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring him up again from the dead? But the one thing that that spirit of mind and attitude of heart will never speak of, it'll always give you something to do and something that you need to keep doing. But it will never speak of eternal union with the Father in the now. It will never speak of Him being closer than the breath that we breathe right now. It will never unveil him as being a person who dwells at one with you. You know, that's the word in the Greek in the New Testament, peace. It's the Greek word irene. And peace means oneness. Peace means union. It actually also means wholeness and completion. You see, in Him, we are complete. Not someday going to be. Colossians chapter 2, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. How can that be? How can you be complete in Him? Oh, well, His love unconditionally and all-inclusively included all of us in his sacrifice. No one was left out. The legal transaction called redemption is overpaid in more than full, and there's not a thing that you and I can say or do about it. It would be wise on our part if we stopped arguing over it with the Father. Because to argue with him, forget it. His mind is made up. You're eternally loved. You're eternally forgiven. Get over yourself. <laughs> Read your New Testament. Open your heart to the Spirit. And let him start flooding you with these things. And showing you these things from his point of view. Because it's all good. He's the high priest of good things to come. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. What I'd be more concerned about is settling for and becoming complacent with ignorance when we have access into this just mother load of all riches in Christ. Just sitting there waiting to be discovered. When will we begin setting our affection on things above? When will we seek after the unveiling of those things? It all depends how valuable it is to you. And, um, you know, I'll say it to you this way. Then we'll get into this because time's ticking here. I'll share it with you guys the way the Lord spoke it to my heart years ago. And this may sting a little bit, but it's the truth. We are as busy as we want to be. We make time for who and what is important to us. And our money is going into what we truly value, despite what our mouths may say. So when it comes to these things and pursuing the deeper fellowship with the Father, it's going to require us that we re prioritize our life. Make some adjustments. 
start giving him the time and the room to show us these things. Instead of wasting so much time and attention and money on things and books and so-called teachings that have nothing to do with the revelation of the Lord Jesus, nothing to do with the comprehension of the New Testament. The silly, stupid things we spend our money on. And then when any preacher even suggests, you know, financial support or whatever, oh, God wants is my money. Well, the world wants your money too, and you keep giving it to the world without batting an eyelash. Oh, but I'm sorry, I don't want to offend you. I want people to like me. When will we love the truth? We're as busy as we want to be. We make time for who and what is important to us. And our money is going into what we truly value. So then we need to kind of reassess, um, you know, am I willing to change and start to become more interested in what interests him? And then I'm going to set my affection on thing, those things and I'm going to start pursuing those things and start becoming open to those things. And my gosh, you ever hear that phrase, you know, you, they get, you give an inch and they take a yard? Well, man, if you give him an inch, just a little bit of room, a little bit of light, oh my gosh, it will, it'll make you lose your taste for everything else. But unfortunately, some people are just so busy that they can't even afford an inch. There's a difference between being busy versus self-important. The Lord give us wisdom to discern the two. As well as busy versus just overly distracted. Anyway, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I'm not giving people something that they need to do to get saved or something they need to do to work up an encounter, bring him down from above, none of that. I'm declaring to them a person. I'm declaring to, the, to, to people what he has done. I'm declaring to people and sharing with people his finished work and what his death reveals, what his death has exposed. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, give people Jesus. And it says, and if you shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Well, why is that significant again? We need to, we need to touch on this point again. Because we looked last week at a, a number of scriptures, or I should say the last video at a number of scriptures, at this staggering reality that when God raised Jesus from the dead, you and I, because we were crucified together with him, because we died together in him, because we were buried together with him, when he therefore rose, guess where we were? In him. All the sin, all the sickness, all the disease, all the just different various kinds of torment, that perhaps plagued us for so many years in our personal lives. If we would just wait, awaken to this union, that there is nothing that we can do or have to do, Jesus did it, and in the doing of it, exposed the reality that we have never been separate from God except in our own minds. We were never enemies of God except in our own minds. He never viewed us that way. You remember in the garden, the Lord showed up to fellowship with Adam. What did Adam do? He ran and hid. Before the Lord even had a discussion with him, before he even questioned whether or not he ate of the tree of which he was commanded not to eat. It's amazing. The presence of God floods the garden. 
And the first thing Adam thinks of is, oh my gosh, I'm going to get a spanking. I better hit, I better hit the high heel, hills, hide behind some tree. Adam never showed that kind of reaction to God before. No wonder the question was, where are you? Why are you running? Why are you hiding? He wasn't there to punish him. He wasn't there to destroy him, spank him or whatever. He's just showing up to fellowship like he always did. But see, Adam, in his mind, perceived him as a threat. Not because he was, but because of Adam's own blindness. And so it has been with us. It has been our blindness of heart. Our unwillingness to open our hearts to the light of the truth that continues to cause us to view him as a threat and even as an enemy, even though that is not how he sees anyone. Anyway. Yeah, American Christianity is going through a lot of shaking and it needs to be because the sad truth is most of it, most of it is nothing more than the teachings of men that have amounted to nothing more than deception and lies and a lot of hurt and confusion that is running rampant in many people's lives as a result. But then again, that's what the prophets prophesied of regarding these days. Hmm. But there's hope. All right, so if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, well, what happened when God raised him from the dead? He raised old John from the dead here. <laughs> and that goes back to verse 8. What saith it? The word is near you. It is even in your mouth and in your heart. So see, I am confessing the Lord Jesus, and in confessing him, declaring him, sharing him, preaching him, however you want to say it, I am not declaring the historical Jesus. I'm declaring a personal Jesus that I have revelation of. And I have an understanding that when he died, I died. So therefore, when God raised him from the dead, God raised John from the dead. And in that union that was exposed at Calvary, that the Spirit has caused me to comprehend comes the realization that the Divine Presence is within. Just as I could see myself in Him on Calvary, so does the Lord Jesus see Himself now in me. And He woke me up to that reality. Therefore, John is not looking for a magical formula Pattern, outline, equation, steps, sequences, sequences of steps, protocols, processes, healing processes, prophetic processings, works in progress, blah, 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 on and on and on and on. So that I can climb some stairway to heaven, bring down the presence, and teach everybody how I got it to happen and write some books. John is also not going to teach people how they can work up an encounter by tons of prayer, tons of fasting, turning up the praise and worship volume to 11 until you blow the speakers. That's not union. That's me seeing him separate from me 
and my trying to close the gap. But as long as I see him separate from me, which is a contradiction of what you would see at Calvary, as long as I see him separate from me, and I put all the pressure on myself to close the gap, what I'm really trying to do is establish and maintain union. There's never been any separation. The cross took out of the way what was at the very source of my thinking that he was separate from me. So you ask what the cross did. It removed what was causing me to see him separate from me and me separate from him. It was the law. And to this day, people who are practicing or attempting to practice, I should say, the dead letter of Scripture, you corner them long enough and get them to talk openly enough you will find out that they see the Father as someone who does not dwell within them, as someone that they don't share union with through the body of Jesus Christ, but they see him as a Pharaoh, as a dragon off somewhere in heaven, that man, they got to like watch all their P's and Q's, have all their ducks in a row, never make a misstep, um, on and on and on. They do not comprehend divine union. Divine union is a free gift in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death exposes that union. How much more should his life in the here and now? If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, well, yeah, if I am aware that his death was my death, if, I've, if my spirit, my heart has comprehended that revelation and lives in the experiential knowledge of it, that his death was my death, and that when he rose, I rose, of course the only thing that I'm going to confess is Jesus. I'm not going to be giving people stuff that they need to do. My heart cry and prayer would be that they would awaken to the Christ within. See, these scriptures are far more than just some dumb, stupid sinner's prayer. There's depth in here. For, for, for God's sake, these are the words of the Lord Jesus, writing through the Apostle Paul. Everything in here is given by inspiration of God. There are no mistakes in here. Nothing is out of place, and there are no contradictions. If we think that there are, we've never put enough time into actually reading and meditating it for ourselves, and we're listening to far too many people, even perhaps well-meaning people's opinions about the Bible, but we've never read it for ourselves and opened our hearts to the Spirit. Anyone can quote scripture who can read, but within the scripture there is a spirit. It's given by divine inspiration, and the same spirit that inspired it to be written is the one who will inspire the understanding of what is written. In the New Testament, the word understanding and revelation are interchangeable. When somebody says that they got a revelation, what they really got is an understanding, an opening of the eyes, to be able to see something that they've not seen before, and in some cases, perhaps many others haven't seen before. And most of the time, when you get around a voice, a true voice who has seen what has not been seen before, that has not come except at a very, very great price. It, it, if it's a faithful voice, they have been and are paying dearly for it. And the thing is, most of what they're saying, at least to their own generation, is always going to be written off as heresy. And two and three generations down the road, they're going to be studying it, 
and say, you know, we should have listened to the idiot because they were onto something and they had the cojones to speak up and say it when they were alive. But, you know, such is the case with prophets. Nobody honors them or gives a crap about them until they're dead and gone. Then they build monuments to them and write books about them. Hopefully there will be that generation that does come. And I can foresee that in the future. I don't know about this one. But in the future, I can see a generation that's open to these things. I think there's a few gener generations that have to, I don't know of a politer way to say it, but I think there's a few generations that need to die off yet. Too much religious crap that they're still carrying, and an unwillingness to let go of their traditional view of Scripture. Oh, they talk it with their mouth. But when it comes to paying the price to walking in it, that is a whole different animal. Still entrenched in those traditions. You know, when you take the word tradition, I think last video I might have said something about the word pierced when the Roman centurion took the uh, spear and pierced Jesus' side after he had already been dead. When you take the... the um, the number values of the Greek letters in the word pierced, and you add them up, the, the, the number or the numeric values of each of the letters found in the word pierced totals 660 and 6. 666. Six, six. We talked about this last video. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go back and watch it. 660 and 6. What it is, is that Jesus had already died. The work that he, that he came to do was a finished work. And so now, just to be sure, we're going to thrust that spear into his side just to make sure that he's dead. So 666 is really our thinking that we need to add something to the finished work. That's that piercing after he had already been dead. But what we don't realize is when we, when we, in our arrogance and in our own pompous opinions, think that we need to add something to the finished work, what we're actually doing is we're detracting and from it and diminishing it. We're actually taking away from it. And that's Revelation chapter 22. Let me read it to you. Doing for time here. Oh, we're doing all right. Revelation 22, check this out. Uh, verse 18, it says, well, actually, let's, you know what? Let's look at verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. I love that. And let him that hears, that, that means to understand intelligently, say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. You hunger for these things? You thirst for these things? Come. Hear it. Wet your whistle. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yum. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. No who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, no, who shall descend into deep, that is to work them up, bring them up, drum them up from the dead. Whosoever will. Are you willing? Are you willing to drink deep? Then take it free of charge. Awaken to it. Embrace it. Drink that presence in. Open your heart to the Spirit. He's already there. Nothing you got to do, no price you got to pay, except your attention. Give him your attention. For God's sake, give him some of your time. I know, we're just so busy. Verse 18, For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things. There it is, 666. That's what the true mark of the beast revolves around. Well, Christ has already died, and we were all included in that death. The work is finished. Let's thrust in that spear just to be sure. Let's pierce him. 
just to be safe. And we do that in so many different areas in Christianity. It's, it, it's really nauseating. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Of course he will. We'll talk about that some other time. It's not what most people think. <laughs> They're going to be plagued by that manifest spirit of Christ operating in and through a people who are open to him. This is all about the unveiling of Christ in a people. And my God, as we allow him to manifest, as we allow him to flow through us, you want to talk about plaguing other people who are not, maybe they're just ignorant of it, maybe they've gotten the light on it a little bit and just turned away from it because they didn't want anything to do with it, but they are going to get plagued, trust me. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. It doesn't... It's, well, we're going to teach on this sometime. It is not what most people think. But the point is that I'm trying to make, at least today, is that when you actually add to that finished work, the pierced, 666, 666, you're actually diminishing the finished work. You're detracting from it. You're taking away from it. I said that to say this. When you take, just like the word pierced, totals 666. When you take the word traditions, it's the traditions of men that make the word of no effect. Likewise, in the Greek, the numeric value of all the letters added together of traditions Total 666. Pierced by the traditions of men. Because they didn't really believe that his death was enough. They didn't really believe that his unconditional and all-inclusive inclusion of us all was enough. There's still something that you got to do. You got to pray that sinner's prayer in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. I don't confess Jesus as Lord to get saved. I confess the Lord Jesus because a revelation dawned on me that he saved me. Big difference. I don't confess Jesus to get saved as in the traditional sense of, I get to go to heaven and fly around on a cloud and avoid hell. I don't confess Jesus to get, quote, saved in the traditional sense. I confess the Lord Jesus because I heard the gospel that imparted into my heart the revelation of God's righteousness, the Father's love for me. And when I understood his love for me, and the fact that he included me in his sacrifice unconditionally. When the gospel was articulately communicated to me, when it was given by inspiration of the Spirit, when I heard that rhema of the Spirit that opened the eyes of my heart and made the eyes of my understanding to behold that righteousness of God, that Father's love it was as it was seen and manifest in the Lamb. And I saw in Him my own death, the mystery of my inclusion. Once I comprehend, I should say once He caused me to comprehend that. You better believe I'm going to confess the Lord Jesus. I don't confess Him to get saved. I confess Him because I am saved. I don't confess him to get saved and go to heaven. I confess him because I possess the revelation that he saved me. And when I have that revelation, I will stop going about attempting to establish my own righteousness. Romans 10 verse 3. That's what his grace saves me from. First verse, I know this is a review, but brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. There's grace. Saved from what? Hell, brother. No, that's just your traditions talking. 
Trust me, the lifestyle you're probably living right now, because you are under that impression, is hell enough. Trust me. Just ask some people who know you. It says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10.3 uh, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of the Father's love, as it is seen and demonstrated in the Lamb on the cross. And going about to establish their own righteousness. See, that's what this revelation of, of Jesus and the union that his death reveals that I have with the Father in the body of Christ, that's what this is all about. Once I see in my spirit that the eyes of my understanding are finally enlightened and I comprehend it, I will stop working so hard to make and keep happy with me a father who already loves me and who's already unconditionally accepted me and unconditionally included me in his sacrifice. I stop working so hard. See, that's the answer to the guys in the Revelation. They have no rest day nor night because they're always obsessing about whether they're doing what God wants them to do, whether they're not doing what God wants them to do, if they are doing what God wants them to do, are they doing enough of it? And it just never ends. The revelation of the Father's love as it is seen in the Lamb. That is our deliverance. So, of course, I'm going to confess Jesus, not to get saved, but because in my spirit I have comprehended the revelation that his death was my death, and he's already saved me. So, of course, I'm going to tell people the good news as well. Did you know you are already unconditionally loved and accepted in Jesus? You don't have to do anything. In fact, you don't even have to believe me. But trust me, under the inspiration of the Spirit as he keeps leading me to talk, you listen to this whack job long enough, you will believe. The Word itself will impart the faith. It's nothing but good news. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Absolutely. From what? Going about attempting to establish my own self-righteousness. That revelation continuously saves me from ever thinking that I got to go back and try to do that. Meaning, what do I need to do to ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? What do I got to do to work him up, drum him up, bring him up again from the dead? What's the secret? I'm not going back there. It's, it's really kind of sad that the church has given the world this impression that they need to pray a sinner's prayer in order to get saved because the irony is that that is the mentality of the first self-righteous spirit that Moses describes, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. You pray this prayer, all of a sudden Jesus comes down and comes in. It's a complete contradiction to what the cross reveals. Are you saying that people who pray the sinner's prayer and because they do, they think they're going to heaven are actually self-righteous? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Salvation isn't based on anything you do. Hello? Did you know that Jesus' name actually means God is salvation? He is my salvation. Not anything that I do. If I could do anything to get saved, why would I need him? What was the purpose of the cross? There were, I mean, read the book of Psalms, for instance. There's countless times in the Old Testament where people and prophets and psalmists would say, Save me, Lord. Well, if, if that would have done the job, why fast forward a couple thousand years, have Jesus born, and have him go to the cross. They prayed the sinner's prayer before Jesus ever showed up. If that's all you needed to do to get saved, why, why go through the cross? 
Because there was something about that cross that had the power to not only, I mean, not only to remove and destroy sin and everything that came into the world through sin, but there was something about that cross that had power to impart a revelation of our union with the Father that no one had ever seen before. And my God, did it happen that day on the cross. <sighs> no prayer saves you. Jesus has saved you. Then verse 10 says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. Let me say that another way. This is one of my Johnisms. For with the heart man, remember, with the heart, man believes under righteousness, but remember what that righteousness is. It is the revelation of the Father's love. So let's say it this way. For with the heart, man awakens unto the Father's love. And that love, what it communicates in and through the Lamb on the cross is our union with God in Christ. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the heart, man awakens unto the Father's love as it is seen in and through the Lamb that shows our inclusion in Him. No wonder the word is nigh you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Stop thinking it's up there and that you got to flawlessly execute these steps to go up and bring it down. Stop thinking that it's down there, that you got to work up, drum up, and bring up this anointing from the dead as if it were dead. It, they tried to kill it. They couldn't. It rose from the He rose from the dead. And the Spirit is here to quicken us to that reality, to bring our slow, dumb, dense, dull brains up to that reality. I love how Jesus uses that word. It's the spirit that quickens. Because yeah, most of us, this dude included, was a little slow for quite a long time. But I'm on board now. I'm still not admitting that I'm quick. I'm just, I just, I bank on his love for me, making up for my slowness. It's a good way to say it. And it does. He always does, and I'm thankful. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the heart, man awakens unto the realization of the Father's love and the mystery of my inclusion in the cross. Because again, it's not just love. It is the love of the Father seen in and through the Lamb on the cross. I'm not interested in any other kind of love. That's the one that makes, and not only makes me free, it keeps me free. There's no going back for me. Say about me what you want. Label me as a heretic, I don't care, I've been called much worse. But there's no going back for me. <laughs> there's no going back. If the heart man believes under righteousness, and with a mouth, conf the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But, but who am I confessing with? My mouth. Oh, the one who is being revealed in my heart by the Spirit, Jesus. I'm confessing him. With the heart, I awaken unto the Father's love. With my mouth, I am confessing the Lord Jesus. And what that is doing is that is... Now, I need to be clear here. It's not my speaking of the words. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that he caused me to comprehend in my heart by his grace. 
my confession of him. that is continually flowing out of that realization that, oh my God, I am in union with him. And his death declares it so. See, that is, quote, saving me from ever attempting to go about and establish my own righteousness ever again. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God has raised him and you from the dead. Well, there's my union. Don't have to go up there to get him. Don't have to go down there to work him up. I'm in union with him. I need to be start becoming conscious of the indwelling presence. I need to start becoming conscious of what his spirit is causing to flow through my heart. And the more I seek that, I seek that. The more I value that, the more I simply set my mind, attention, and affection on that, I discover that there is this living, abiding word that is already within me that continues to declare him, continues to unfold the mystery of who he is in me, who I am in him, what he has done at Calvary, the, the just staggering redemptive reality uh, regarding everything he has done concerning sin, the past, um, everything. And as long as I remain aware of that and just speak the truth and love from the heart, not only does that continually keep me from going back into that mess, when other people get around it, i found that it has the same effect on them. What a word. What a word. I should probably say one more time, I'm not confessing him to get saved. I'm confessing him because my heart comprehended a revelation that I am saved. My heart has comprehended a revelation that he saved me. So of course I'm going to declare him. And anyone I have found who is presently caught up in trying to ascend to heaven and bring him down from above or to do something crazy to work him up from the dead and let, as if he were dead, I have found over the decades that I am a very offensive person to those individuals. Not because of me. It's the revelation of Jesus. It makes the intellectual mind feel stupid <laughs> because you can't work it up. You can't apply it perfectly enough. It's not about any of that. The gospel is not a revelation of our sin. Romans 3 says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God, or you can say it this way. The law, by the law is the knowledge of sin, but in and through the gospel is the revelation of the Father's love. And when you, when you comprehend it, when, when you comprehend it, it's like, dear God, Jesus has saved me. He saved you too. It's not about what you have to do to get saved, not about what you got to do to get to heaven. In fact, Jesus never taught that stuff. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. In earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. The dwelling of God is with men. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is what the gospel should reveal. Not a God up there you need to bring down. Not a God down there you need to bring up. A Christ in here, dwelling in the heart, dwelling in the mouth, closer than the breath that we breathe, 
and he's called the high priest of good things to come. It's only good things to come. A God and Father with whom we are already in union, with whom we already share a union in and through the physical body of Jesus Christ. Wow. He is my union with the Father. And he's your union too. Your sins have already been forgiven you. When are you going to learn to enjoy your forgiveness. You know, many times people who have physical problems have a difficult time receiving healing. Not because their faith isn't strong enough, but they never actually heard the gospel regarding what Jesus Christ did with their sins on the cross. And as long as you and I continue to keep focusing on us ourselves as being sinners, we never really truly will believe in our hearts that we're worthy enough to receive healing. We'll talk about that sometime. It's always interesting how uh, Jesus would always deal with the sin issue first, and then healing would flow. The apostles wrote about that truth in the epistles. It's all throughout the Old Testament. The number one thing that is plaguing most people, even people who do have some sort of physical illness, whether minor or serious, I guarantee you there's something greater plaguing their hearts. The fact that they think that God sees them as his enemy because of a bunch of wrong, bad things that they've done over the course of their life, and they have never truly come to terms with his unconditional love and forgiveness. We're always trying to get people healed, but we're missing a deeper heart issue. It is a greater likelihood that they will be healed if they first are able to comprehend that they have already been unconditionally loved and forgiven, eternally loved and forgiven. There will be a greater likelihood that they will receive healing once they hear the true gospel that reveals that Jesus Christ absorbed their sin. When he died, he destroyed their sin. And not only that, he forgave it all. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, divine love keeps no record of the wrongs committed against him. Oh, if we could just see that. I bet you there'd be a lot more manifestations of healing. Just something to think about. Well, I'm out of time today, guys. I hope that helped. hope it didn't confuse you, uh, add to any confusion or anything like that. But um, yeah, just remember, He is our Savior, and He has saved us. It is finished. When that revelation hits us, when we see it, we will confess the Lord Jesus. We will believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead because we will be experiencing that life within because of our union that his death reveals. I'm not confessing him to get saved. I'm confessing him because I am saved and because he saved me. Not when I prayed a sinner's prayer. Oh, no, no, all the way back at Calvary. That's when the whole world was legally saved. He basically absorbed and Honestly, he rewired the entire cosmos, the entire created order. What a revelation. The cross of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul said, I don't boast or glory in anything else other than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, no man, let no man trouble me anymore about this keeping of the law and doing the commandments sort of thing. He said, I bear up my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. It's not my law keeping that's doing that. 
It's the fact that I was included in, the, in, this, in, in this glorious sacrifice. And in the humiliation and weakness of the Lamb's death, he exposed my union. What an amazing revelation. What an amazing word. What, a, what an amazing revelation. No one's been excluded. We just need to awaken unto the union. And I guess my final question to you would be, where is the message that does so? Where's the message that awakens people to their union with the Father in Christ? Where is the message that proclaims everyone's unconditional and all-inclusive inclusion in him? That the legal transaction is done. The legal transaction has been overpaid in more than full. Where's the message that stops pointing the finger at people and telling them something they need to do to get saved or get, get their lives straight, get straight, get right, all this stuff? None of that has anything to do with the gospel, people. Wake up! It's not about what I have to do, you have to do, or they have to do, or anything that anyone has to do for that matter. It's all about him, what he has done. And all that his glorious death reveals. The word is nigh you. It is even in your mouth and in your heart right now. Awaken to it. And we'll see you next time. God bless you guys. Love you. Bye-bye.